để tìm, để gặp, để hiểu, để yêu và để phục thờ Thiên Chúa. Khi chúng ta cầu nguyện không phải là để Chúa làm theo ý mình, mà để mình hiểu được và làm theo ý Chúa. When we tell someone you should love him, forgive him, this and that, right? We have done that. But be honest with you, I have struggled this with preparing the holiday, thinking about it. Because as soon as I tell you you need to forgive him or her, you shouldn't judge him or her, I'm already commit the sin of judgment. Am I right? Because in order to tell you, Jerry, you should forgive your daughter, that means I'm really just too wrong. In order to tell you, you should forgive. If I tell you you should love your enemies, be really honest, do I love my enemies? Particularly if people love to tell me, oh, Father, you should give this and do this and that. I said, well, of what God said in that whole paraphrase that you just caught out one sentence, God said, give those who ask you, give me all your money and I will do it. <laughs> would you do that? God said that also. So be honest, it's really a struggle to do what God said, tell us to them. The only one who actually has the right to say that is God, neither you nor I. Because as soon as we open our mouth, we already commit the guilt of doing the order opposite. And I'm so glad, so I'm looking for a loophole. You know, sometimes the Bible has a loophole. I'm looking for a loophole to see where I can push on. And I found one. Of all those beautiful things, they say, do good to all the forgive those, lend to them, uh, love them. But one thing he takes, he doesn't say that you have to do, is to live with your enemy. He said, love them, forgive them, give it to them, but he never said live with them. Because God knows, Jesus knows, when you live with your enemy, that will be homicide detected being coined. Serious. He doesn't say leave with your enemy. And when we look at here, we sit in here today. I, I'm the first witness and probably your grandparents. Hey, I grew up in a communist country. Your grandparents probably grew up in a country where persecution and this was terrible government. Now, Jesus said love them. He doesn't say leave with them. That's why I escaped. Because I don't want to leave with them. If he tells us to leave with them, then why are we here? Isn't that true? He doesn't say you have to leave. And I found that loophole not just for myself. In the first reading from the book of Samuel, Saul took 3,000 chosen men to go after one man named David. But you know, I don't know if you know that, but right now we are preparing for the summit between Trump and Kim Jong-un in Vietnam. In the last few days, you know what on the front page of every Vietnamese newspaper? Not about the summit. How good looking the CIA agent are. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, the woman, yo, yeah, oh, they are crazy. You know, this is not just a CIA secret, this is the military special force, you know, with the president travel like that. I mean, these one with heavy uh, guns and whatever that they can blew out anything that they saw. I mean, and when they arrived in Vietnam, the last three days, that's all on the front page of every newspaper, on the top of every woman's lips. And they just say, oh, look at this man. And they just like, oh. But anyway, these are not just regular, they are chosen men. 3,000 to go after one man, David. And when they go after David, David was smart enough to stick behind them. So instead of chasing them, David is actually behind the one who chased them. And Saul was sleeping. The book of Samuel tells us today, Saul was sleeping with his spear, his sword, a spear into the ground, right next to his head. When and all his men surrounded him, and the Lord made all those three thousand men slept. 
And David at his right hand man, what is it, the name of Sheesh? What's that? Abishai, right? Abishai got all the way, so past all the 3,000 men, got right to Saul. And Abishai said, David, you want me to give him one spear that's hard. Your life, miserable, is God. You no longer have to worry about these men chasing after you. One spear, that's all I need. David said, no, don't do that. What did David do? David took the saw spear. <clears throat> you see, the Lord didn't say you have to live with your enemy. What did David do after he took the spear? He climbed up to another mountain. And then he said, I am here, I got your spear. <clears throat> you see how that works? You see, I found loopholes in that, huh? David didn't just stay there. David climbed to another mountain, woke the man up and said, hey, I got your spear, I forgive you, but don't come any close. <laughs> See ya? We talk about forgiveness, love. You know, being a pastor here in American church, it greatly troubled me a lot this past few weeks. Particularly this when I have talked with many parishioners who asked to talk to me. The struggle with the, the issue within the church recently. Of all the scandals and everything. They struggle with when the when they said that, that in October they would deal with that. And then Rome said, Don't do anything. We gather with all the president of the bishop conference around the world. 131 of them. The president of the conference of bishops around the world. Nine, 39 bishops from the Eastern Catholic Church of the Visa Park. And the leaders of religious congregation, 190 of them meeting in Rome the last four days. I think today is the last day. And you know, even with the councils, the Pope doesn't there, it's not there all the time. He come in and out. This one, the Pope stays up at every meeting for the last four days. He does nothing but stay in those meetings, you listen. Now, be honest with you, I never expect anything good out of this council. Personally, from the American point of view, I'm not saying it's not good for the whole Catholic Church. I'm talking about the American Catholic Church. You know why? This is how I look at them. American country leaders or the church have always taken the lead we don't follow. It doesn't matter what we do around the world, we lead. We create things. We put policies. We lead by our own actions. We don't follow. So you have a meeting of 131 bishops around the world. What do we learn from that? Really nothing. Because we already deal with these things. It may be good for the churches around the world. For example, in Vietnam. Yes, that this issue is serious. You need to go home and deal with that. Don't we know that? Don't we think measures to do that already? These are good for all the churches. I'm not saying it's not good meaning. It's good for all the churches. What I don't see, I don't expect a lot of them come out of it for the American churches. I, as a priest, I see that, but many parishioners now. So they begin to support about the meeting. They have talked to me. They set appointments. They struggle to let it go, to love, to forgive. And you and I, we all know, love and forgiveness doesn't come because I want to or you want to. It's come from both sides of the aisles. For example, you would forgive Polo if he slapped you once and he stopped. He promised he wouldn't do that. But if you wouldn't forgive him and love him, if every day he go home from work and he would like slap you around, am I right? He did it once. Now, I'm not saying it's right, Polo. And don't try to do it once, okay? <laughs> and you say, well, Father said that you can do once. <laughs> well, Father didn't say that. Father said, example. Right? If you do once and you said, I'm sorry, I'm stupid, I was half drunk, I was out of control, this and that, you forgive and love him with the condition that he would repent. Not forgive and love so that he can continue to do that to you every day. Now, unless you Jesus Christ, 
unless you got. Am I right? With the human part, God forgives unconditioned. We don't. We have the condition. We human. So love and forgiveness come from both ends. It has to be responsible for our action. Apologize for that. Make it up and stop doing it. Not just say, let it go and I'm not going to do it. Being a counselor, you deal with that problem a lot, Catherine. You tell them. They have to deal with that. Get to the root of the things and get it out. And it's a struggle. It's a struggle for me. It's a struggle for many of you. About love and forgiveness. When we point out somebody's wrongdoing, that doesn't mean we condemn. It's helpful. And by the way, don't we do that in a sacrament of reconciliation? You know one of the conditions for the sin to be forgiven? You know what the one of the conditions is that you actually have to have the full intention to stop doing it. Right? Not, oh I'm smart, I'm sorry for all these things, but I'm thinking I'm gonna go home and do it anyway. No. The, even for the forgiveness of sin, there's a condition for that. A complete detached of those intentions are bad. Now that doesn't mean we don't do it, but it's the complete intention. So when the Lord calls us to forgive, to love, is that He just tell us our condition? Yeah, probably that's when I get to heaven, I could do that. But until then, man, there's a condition on top of everything. That's a human point. As I said, God alone can say it, not me, not you. So what do we learn? How do we do it? People ask me all the time, Father, why is that happening? Why, why, why? I say, I don't know. I'm just a lowly, nobody, countryside pastor. I'm being punished to be out here with you. <laughs> you being punished to have me too. But you know what? Punishment could become a blessing, a heaven, when we all work together. I, I don't know about you, I have been in heaven the last four plus years being your pastor here. Most of you probably not in heaven, but maybe you in purgatory, how's that sound? <laughs> well, because now you in purgatory, you go to heaven. You know that, you, you, you on your way. As long as you're not in hell, you're good. But we work together. We put out the wrong decision we made. The councils, the leadership, talk to me about, oh, Father, I don't think that's right. You know, I don't think we, we need to make the decision. This and that. That's how it's better. When we're pointing out those wrong from each other, that doesn't mean we condemn it, we don't love and forgive, but that's how we make it better. There's a lot of these seasons, or a lot of things that I said I'm going to do. I came into the council, getting excited. As soon as I begin to open my mouth, I said, it's not as good as I think it is. Have you experienced that? When you get so excited about something, and you begin talking about it, and then you go, ah, never mind. Never mind. It's not as good as I think it is. And then all the people come in. So yes, we are called to love. To forgive, to feed, to help, but at the same time, God calls us. We don't have to leave with one another. And I'm so glad you guys leave in here with me, because that means we're not enemies. We're not enemies. This church is growing with the people coming. That means we're not enemies. We love, care, support so that we can go to heaven. We're not here to condemn. We're not here to push people down. So my dear beloved, I think we can end up the homily with the response of real song. At the end of the gospel, the Lord is merciful and kind. kind. My you and I,
we be kind to one another, be merciful to one another, be supportive to one another, until we get to heaven and have that unconditional forgiveness. Until then, may everything we do give the glory to God's name. Amen. Amen.